Welcome back to Matt and Dwight Just Might, a podcast about two Midwestern comedians who are talking about their wins and losses in comedy and also in life, love, liberty, loquaciousness, LL Cool J's lat pull downs. <laughs> are, you uh, are you ready for the new one? Yeah, I'm ready. I haven't skipped one, have I? What's no, the, I think you got. I, I think you hit them all. Okay, and lumpia, delicious, delicious lumpia. Limp. Okay, you know all what right. Lumpia? I I thought you said lumpia, like to clean. Oh, <laughs> no, I said I said lumpia, but uh, we okay. Could, like, yeah, it's either or. If you're if you're wanting to clean, or if you want to have delicious Filipino egg rolls, either one. Oh, you're making me hungry now. This all is right. a yeah. Is that that's fresh on your mind, right? I haven't had some in a while, but uh, I was just thinking of my favorite L words, and that definitely popped up. <laughs> <laughs> I dig it. Welcome into the podcast, everybody. Matt, how are you doing, my brother? I'm good. Dwight, uh, you had uh, quite the run. I don't even mean to just jump into it. We can we can fuck around and not talk about comedy for 20 minutes at the top like we had in the last <laughs> episodes. <laughs> But I thought we'd switch it up for this one, and we might just jump in there and do uh, and start talking about the comedy talk right out of the out of the gate. What do you think? Uh, I like it. I mean, people really tune in for our takes on hip hop culture and sure. Rihanna and Super Bowl performances. But sorry to let you guys down. I think we're gonna we're gonna keep it focused on standing up comedy. For as long as possible, no promises now. Yeah, we will get uh, distracted and sidetracked and, and meander. There's that's for sure. Uh, first of all, is that a new uh, Hooch shirt that you're wearing, dude? I, it is a Hooch shirt. Oh yeah, man. So our good friend from Winston Salem, uh, Jerry Cooper, owner of Hoots Brewing Company, uh, sent me a couple shirts. He sees that I wear. I use. I've been using the same headshot for probably four years. And I'm wearing a Hoots shirt that I got last time we were in Winston-Salem. Mm -hmm. And he just hit me up. He's like, hey, man, thanks for repping the brand. Let me send you some swag. He sent me three shirts. Nice. I know. I'm a, So I will definitely be shouting him out on social media. So Yeah, um, there you go. Yeah, we, we, we're, we're known for our reverse sponsorships, but this might be an actual <laughs> sponsorship. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we yeah we're uh, twelve episodes in. We've earned three T-shirts. Yeah, and by we you mean you. Uh, yeah. <laughs> no. I have the same hoot shirt that you have on in that headshot, and there's definitely been times where we've showed up to do shows together, and we're both wearing it. Um, oh yeah, yeah, and it, which is a thing that runs. I mean, I don't know if you have this. Like, I'm currently wearing my uh, white rabbit hoodie, which is my favorite hoodie. Shout yes, sir. White rabbit and Indy. And I've definitely well, either picked, got to pick you up, or showed up at Brent or Hune's house, and one of us has to change. Like, yeah. one of us immediately has to change our clothing. You're like, is this a themed show? <laughs> like, we're not getting paid enough to be like walking billboards. Yeah, that's true. But, but uh, you know. At least it's, I think it's just if we're matching, but also, did I don't even know if we talked about this on the podcast, but when we did that run out to Arkansas, and I think I had maybe like a Helium Comedy Studio or Helium Comedy Club hoodie, and you had a, a Laughing Tap hoodie, maybe. Yep. And every gas station we stopped that because we both had comedy related <laughs> gear on. The person behind the counter was like, oh, "So, you, so you guys comedians? Are you good?" <laughs> yeah. It's like, nah, man. It's, that is maybe that's a thing where like we've been doing it so long we have so much crossover merch mm -hmm. and like you obviously have things that are your favorite to wear like you love that white rabbit hoodie i love that laughing tap hoodie it's comfortable it's not always the case that comedy clubs have real comfortable wearable merch so like you recycle the four or five things and we seem to we seem to like things that are black that have white print. Yeah. That's our style. Clean. That's our yeah. style. And also not only just comfortable because they are like the higher end like blending of things, but also a lot of times I love I love some great comedy clubs who have terrible, terrible merch. Like yeah. the logos <laughs> the logo for the club is awful and it's just like the merch is bad. Um, you know, I, I stopped getting comedy addict stuff because I have so many different variations on the shirt. You know, it's a very classic logo and everything. Uh, but you know, Jared, particularly at the comedy act has moved to making a bunch of tie dyed shit. And I'm like, yeah, oh, so I'm not, I, I'm not wearing a tie dyed shirt. I'm just, <laughs> <laughs> it's like, it's just not my thing. And nothing against anybody who, who rocks it and pulls it off, but it's just not, I'm not David Brooks is what I'm saying. All yeah. Right, you I'm can't, not, yeah. You can't shout out to David Brooks again. My man, uh, the blonde bomber of Indianapolis. 
Um, that's not what I'm. <laughs> he's very funny. You can't yeah. say a comedian's a bomber. Yeah. Uh, it was meant as a compliment, a term of endearment. <laughs> a lot of a lot of comedy clubs uh, they rock the camo. Really? Like, yeah. See, like camo merch. Hmm. Maybe that's more in the south, but Maybe it's more in the south. Yeah, yeah. it's like you know, uh, no thanks. Yeah. No thanks. Give me my black and white, baby. Yeah, there it is. Uh, so, uh, speaking of comedy clubs, you just did a nice little run of shows last week. You had a pretty busy week last week. Do you want to talk about where you've been and I, how it went? I do want to. Oh, Matt, do I want to talk about it? <laughs> I've been waiting to talk about it. <laughs> I did. So, last week started, I think I mentioned this. Uh, so, Monday was Lucas Waterfills. Um, it was his album release or special release, so I did that here in Indianapolis, which was great. And then Wednesday, it was back on the road. I did Port Huron, Michigan. Mm -hmm. That's next to Canada, for those keeping track. Uh, it's next to Canada. Like, is if it? you miss... It is! Port Huron, it's like the last exit before you get to Canada. Oh, because, but over by the Detroit side, like, right? Yeah. Like, yeah. Yeah, yeah it's, it's, not, not, like, it's not like all the way at the top of the mitten, not all the way at the top. No. Of whatever. It's not up here. It's like here, right? Yeah, are you doing the Wisconsin? Just, well, <laughs> yeah, oh, the, yeah, the Michigan. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> are you not, so it's like, you know, you get you see the signs that say last exit before Canada. Right. It's like, I hope people are paying attention because yeah. <laughs> there's no re-entry to the United States. So... I did that, and then it, it's a bar show. It's a giant bar. Um, had a couple openers, and during the host set, the mic went out. So the owner of the bar had to change the mic cord in between the uh, guest set and feature, and he couldn't figure it out. I was praying for the man. He just could not figure out this mic cord. Finally figures it out, gets a big round of applause. But have you done this room? What's the what's the name of the room? The room is called Lynch's. Lynch's oh, Irish yeah. Bar yeah, and Tavern. I've done that, yeah, I've done that years ago. I did it a few times. And yeah. it is a weird, you're in like a corner. Yeah. And at least that's how it was back then. You were in a corner and it's kind of a long, oblong shaped bar with big high ceilings and a big massive cheers style bar in the middle. Like that takes up a big, pretty big footprint. Am I rem remembering it correctly? Like the, the actual a... bar that you can belly up to is kind of a big major structure in the middle. It's so they so they it, there's doing they're doing clear renovations because they're okay. still like moving around benches. They have brand new tables. The stage is an actual stage, like music stage, okay. off to the side. But the room is still massive and spread the fuck out. Like nobody's near each other, and the bar is so far away. And there's seats at the bar that they're paying attention, but. It just has the feel that you can't get any cohesiveness yeah. in this show because there's no rhythm. Like, it was a lot of work. The show was fine, but it felt like more work than it should have been for a show like that. You know, we had about 50 people in that room. Um, and then they had the, you know, there's like six, seven people in the back that just won't stop talking. Of course. Yeah. And, you know, I didn't address it. It's such a big room, I couldn't even see. You could just hear it from the stage. Right. Well, that's a problem, too. Like, if you cannot, if you can't really see the problem, it's hard to yeah. them because then you're just kind of yelling in a direction. <laughs> 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 and they don't even know that you're also addressing them. You know, it's just like, it's a, it's a yeah. lose-lose for sure. And it really is on the, it should be on the venue to police the, the room and kind of be... Um, I agree, we, man. We, we talk about a lot of these kind of like one-nighters, and they're not ideal situations, but we go in and we make the best of it. And sometimes they can be good shows, and sometimes they're brutal. But there is one that is like this sort of same kind of thing that was for years, it was a funny business room in Spring Lake, mm -hmm. Michigan, where it was in the bar for the uh, ho Holiday Inn or something. And so you actually stayed right down the hallway from where you performed. Yeah, um, I think I did and, that. But they... They were militant, man. They have, like, they shut the fuck up cards on every single table. They turn the TV off. The guy who's the bartender who's been the bartender there for, like, 100 years, it sounds like. Uh, like, he just has, like, this <laughs> grizzled voice. He goes up, and he announces to everybody, like, you will shut the fuck up during this comedy show. I love that. Yeah. I yeah, love it. Yeah. Well, this bar, I met the owner before the show, and he sat down and just watched the show. 
just by himself. <laughs> like, there was no militant, about, like, it didn't bother him. I was like, it doesn't bother him, it doesn't bother me. So, did that, I'd give it a 6 out of 10. Okay. And Are then... start scoring our show? <laughs> yeah, well, specifically, I wanted to score them for the next few shows that okay. I'm about to tell you about. Okay. Uh, to give some... <laughs> to give some depth. Um, Thursday, I did my show in Chicago at On Tour Brewing. It was a brew two comedy zero. joint. Do you give that one a zero. <laughs> <laughs> I ain't shit. You want to hear about not policing the room? Uh, <laughs> uh, fantastic. You, said, you sat down and heckled him, right? You like? I did. Yeah. <laughs> it, it, Matt, it helps the comics. They want you to do this. I know. Everybody knows this. <laughs> everybody knows this. Haven't you seen TikTok? Uh, <laughs> And then I fell off the stage. But the the show was great. It's easy to book, you know, shows in Chicago. There's just such a depth of talent. I had Chris Higgins, who's hilarious. I had Chelsea Hood. Um, I usually run it as a showcase style, but our, our good friend Brent Terhune was passing by. So I just kind of built the show around him. Mm-hmm. And we packed it out. And it was a great, great show, great turnout. Love Chicago. Got snowed in. That's, so I drove from Port Huron, Michigan, to Chicago, and it was fine. And then by the time the sh- show started, the snow started. By the time the show was over, I couldn't open the door to my my baby Prius. Had to had to uh, give him one of those. Yeah, had to give him one of those. Most of that you broke your uh, your your ice scraper too. Your ice scraper. I did. Too. Yeah, I did. I wasn't so I usually so I don't have to deal with parking in Chicago. I usually. Just leave my car at the the place where the show is, mm-hmm. um, and I did this, and I went to see Ant Man, um, a late night Ant Man viewing after the show, and then the next day tried to scrape, and my goddamn three dollar Dollar General ice scraper broke. Would you even believe it? I do believe it, and that's why I'd like to talk to you about this class action suit I have against Dollar General and their faulty. <laughs> <laughs> we can get some money for it. We can get at least we can at least get my money back. Yeah, yeah, maybe we might get the dollar. <laughs> yeah. Uh, all right. So, but good show, hot show. Yep. But then you had to deal with the the uh, frozen car bullshit. So, yep. Yeah. And then I drove to uh, Springfield, Michigan, mm-hmm. um, and boy. Boy, oh boy. Matt, gonna, you ever like, yeah, go ahead, go I'm ahead. Gonna, I'm just going to like, we're going to pull the curtain back a little bit here for a second and just yep. say that since we've started this podcast, we have both been very good about not texting each other about how shit's been going on the road we've been saving for the podcast. Mm-hmm. But you you had to tell me. I did. <laughs> yeah, I, I, got te- I got a couple of text messages that night. I was like, oh, this cannot wait to the podcast. Okay. No, I had, because you had done the room the week before. Yeah. And you texted me, mm-hmm. and for some reason I was like, "Oh, he's just being dramatic," because <laughs> you you had the thing where the owner was like, "Oh, for the last eight shows, we got was standard room only," and then you came, and then yeah, I'm sorry, man. He didn't phrase it like that, but he he, he did basically say that. But as soon as I walked in, he's like, yeah. "Yeah, man, the last seven shows are sold out, but tonight's a little light," which is like the most. Stereotypical yep. uh, GM thing. He was very nice, though, you know, and I believe him. I'm sure that they did sell out until, yeah. you, until you and I got there. <laughs> you know, you know why? Like, I believe him because it's not a giant room. Yeah. Like, you you pull into the parking lot, and you do have that reaction of like, why am I doing this to myself? Because it's like out of the movie Roadhouse. Mm-hmm. I feel like I walk in, and it's just Beverly Hills Cop. Uh, where the music scratches, the lightly playing music, mm. and you know the bartender is very nice because she's bartending and she's also seating people. So I walk in, she's like, "Do you have a reservation?" I was like, "I'm, I'm, I'm on the show." I like struggled to get it out because I didn't want it to be true. Uh, <laughs> I'm on the show. The stage. You look at the stage, and it's just covered in American flags, Mm -hmm. but not real American flags, like wooden, someone made these American flags, and there's different types, they got the OG, the OG one, and then you got the, uh, the one with like the blue line in the middle, Mm -hmm. that's front and center, and then you have the, the POWMIA one, 
yeah. just yeah, just so that we could get a cross section of different people who are fans of different American flags. Yeah, the crazy thing about that room is I've done it a couple of times, and that's actually fewer American flags than they used to have up there. Um, <laughs> they had more than three. They had more. I think the time that I did it last time, there were five. Uh, and it was like the Blue Lives Matters, Red Lives Matters, the OG one, the POW MIA, and there might have been just like another OG one, but it was all like, you know, um, bombs bursting in air, tattered looking, like it had been through some shit, you know? Yeah. Uh, which, again, accurate for America in 2023, you know? That's sure. Um, yeah, the thing with uh, my thing that I tried to joke about on from the stage last week from that place was like the POW MIA flag is right. It's right on the front of the stage. It's the one that's closest to the audience. It's the one that they have to look past to see you doing jokes. And I was like, I joked around. I was like, this doesn't really get anybody in the mood for laughing, does it? Like remembering the ones who never came home. Does that get you guys in the mood for comedy? And they did not think that was funny at all. Oh uh, man, <laughs> jeez. Well, I you dug should... myself a hole. I just dug myself a pothole that I had to then quickly get out of. <laughs> I was like, okay, it's just funny to me. I guess. Okay. <laughs> Oh, you, that's, uh, you shouldn't feel bad because they didn't think anything I had to say was worth laughing at or acknowledging outside of, um, I had an opener who was very funny. Um, I, you know, very professional, polished, had a set executed and they gave him nothing, gave him nothing. I was like, whoo wee, have I never wanted to do 45 minutes less in my life? And, uh, you know, you do, you try to pull out all the tricks to get the audience going. You're like, all right, I'm going to do some crowd work. I'm going to make fun of the room. Uh, like you said, making fun of the room. Tremendous miscalculation. Uh, they are <laughs> adamant um, about how much they like these flags. And I'm like, all right, are we, I think I said, are we remedial here or something? And I said, Springfield. I said, Springfield. And a lady goes, this is Battle Creek. You're in Battle Creek. And I was like, oh, is that why you guys don't like me? Have I just been saying the wrong state or the wrong place? Uh, and she's like, oh, it's a, it's a big deal. And other people were like, what the hell's wrong with this lady? It was the most interaction. And normally I would just like move on. But I was so starved for any human interaction that I just... I just made the rest of the set about Battle Creek versus Springfield. Like this, how, how much time was that that you filled with Battle Creek versus Springfield? I would try to dip into material, right. and I'd say for about 20 minutes, I would just bring it back to <laughs> Battle Creek. Like, every tag had to be Battle Creek versus Springfield. It's just survive in advance. Did it work? Get them on board? It worked for, like, probably the first six or seven minutes, and then they're like, all right, we know the trick. Yeah, yeah. Stop, stop. And then, so, I finish the show, and <laughs> it's, you can't even escape, because you got to wait to get paid. You can't escape, so I go sit, I walk through the audience, sit at the bar, where everyone can still see you, by the way. Mm -hmm. You can't even, like, go hide in shame. And then, like, no shit, like, six different people were like, oh my god, that was so great. That was so great. Oh, we just love coming to comedy here. I was like, don't ever come back. This is this was the worst show I've done in like over a year. Absolutely terrible. Uh, Two so, out of ten. Okay, I did get I I did get paid. So you did get paid. Yeah. yeah. So there is that. Uh, my experience, I I think I talked about it on the podcast where my opener was uh, was very solid and good, but they gave him nothing. And I don't know if I'm just better at being a hack than you, but I actually got them. Like, and I did, the way I got them is I did a lot of crowd work pretty much out of the gate. My first mm -hmm. joke, nothing. And I was like, okay, they're going to give me the exact same shit. And so I did, I wound up leading with a lot of crowd work. And yeah. I had a big, which when we had texted with each other, I know that you didn't have this. I had a, like an eight top right up front in front of the mm -hmm. stage who wanted to play. Right. They wanted to be part of the show, kind of. And so they were great. And then I also had this woman off to the side that was like uh, this first date. like, uh, And they were like in their, you know, probably late, late 40s, early 50s. She wanted to be part of the show. So I had a lot to work with. Right. Um, so uh, I I thought it was great. I would have given it a, <laughs> <laughs> an 8 out of 10. No. Um, uh, but I could, was, well, I got weird. there. Yeah, I got there early. So I got to see people come 
for the show, and it was like nobody wanted to sit up front. And you know, because I roasted their asses. Last I time. know they were like, <laughs> we can't deal with that shit again. We definitely can't deal with that shit again. Uh, yeah. So the people that ended up in the front were these young. I'd probably say like early twenties. Just a group of guys that just could not make I. They couldn't sustain eye contact with me. It was like you know their first. Then we talked about people's first comedy show, so they don't know how to like actually interact Mm -hmm. and I even asked like because I was like who here has been to a comedy show before and like four people clapped five people clapped and this this table was just like I don't this is novel to us and um so and it felt that way it just felt like I was a talking head even like trying to get like or just the uh what's there to do after what's there to do here in Battle Creek if you will. <laughs> First of all, that woman is in Crown. It's right next to Battle Creek, but you're actually in Springfield when you go. When that, the, they lay on the Springfield side of shit, mm-hmm. not, not in Battle Creek. So she wrong. Uh, oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I should. But, yeah, I definitely should have well actually her. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that would have gone a lot better. Probably. Yeah, that, that would have been good for me. <laughs> uh, there is that thing, though, and I think we have, I don't know if we talked about it just in person with one another or on the podcast, but... I don't think there's enough data in for this, but there does seem to be a thing where a lot of younger people don't know how to act at a comedy show if they've never been because the comedy that they've experienced has all been on their phones, right? TikTok right. And, and Instagram reels and stuff like that. So they're not used to laughing and being part of a group dynamic and all that kind of stuff. And so, you know, it is tough if there's not at least a couple of people to get that vibe going in a room. The room, is it's, it's a weird... It's a weird, uh, almost like momentum thing or inertia. Right. There's an inertia to an audience. And if they are all, or most of them are, we're not going to laugh at anything, then the rest of them are like, oh, I guess we're not going to laugh at anything. Yeah. Whereas if you get a couple of people that are willing to go, it cracks everything out. And so, um, yeah, I don't know. Like, did you sell any merch? Did you bother selling merch? Because I no, ended up selling hell... more merch than I thought I would. Oh, really? And it wasn't from anyone that I did crowd work. Not one person that I did all the crowd work with. But people that were sitting behind them, I, I did okay on merch. Not great, but I did okay. Yeah. And, you know, definitely great for that room and for the number of people who were there. So, yeah. yeah. I didn't bother. I didn't, like, I didn't, the show was so bad, I didn't want to speak to another human. I was in such a bad mood. <laughs> I was so mad. This is, it felt like there was nothing I could do to win them over outside of just, like, become a character of myself. Yeah. Uh, and I did it. So that was, that was an emotional last roller coaster of like, all right, having a mediocre show to a great show to a terrible show. And then on Saturday, I was in Sagatuck, Michigan, which I've done before. It's a tourist town, uh, water yacht city. Uh, you do it in the summer. And I think we've talked about this. You just see the biggest boats you've ever seen in your life. Um, and then it doesn't pay well, and they don't put you up. And it's just like, can I sleep on your yacht, please, sir? Um, yeah. But I've done it. I've done it like four or five times, and I don't know why I keep going back. I think it's because I do have fun, and this show was no exception. I had a really, really good time. Uh, sold some merch on that show. That's good. Um, they, <laughs> I could tell that I had gone over, and that's how I know I was having fun because what they do is like, there's a comedy show upstairs. And then downstairs, they start karaoke. And, like, before I got into my closer, I could hear karaoke starting. So I was like, I got to get the fuck off stage. But that show, yeah, 7 out of 10. Okay. Which is crazy to say in Saga Tuck in February. Yeah. But Yeah. Now, would it have been a 7 out of 10 had you not had the show that you had the night before to compare it to? Honestly, no. <laughs> like, if this was a 1, I would just be like, yeah, it's an average 5. Yeah. It's an average 5. But, yeah, it was... Uh, yeah, I don't know. Love Rocky that. Rocky getting <laughs> Rocky getting up after the seventh time of getting knocked down. So uh, I've only done Saga. I think I've only done it once or twice. I, I don't do it anymore. I had one of the worst shows of my career there. Um, it, 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 they must do it differently because I was. We were actually downstairs, and like the karaoke or a band or something was actually down a hallway on the same sort of basement level, but over to the right from where mm-hmm. we performed. 
Um, and but I had a crazy allergic act- reaction while like right before I went on stage, and my nose would not stop running. Oh like, shit! I was spinning so much. I was I was it was just gross. I was just constantly blowing my nose. I just had like wads of like napkins. I was trying to and I was just trying to get through the set. And I was such a baby headliner at that time too. That yeah. I'm just like I didn't know what to do, and so they, I don't think they would ever have me back. Maybe now it's been years. But I also don't want to do it because it is the lowest paying one nighter show in the Midwest, probably. I would say. Um, I think for by an actual agency, Let's right? That way, not just like uh, some comics or some you know small bar that doesn't know what they're doing, but actually booked by an agency. Yeah. Um, it is, in my opinion, it's like half the pay of what you should be getting. Yeah. So, Hundred. Yeah. Hundred uh, percent. I I decide I decline. It's it's good. actually yeah, I guess they will have me back or they forgot about me because I have had it been offered to me a couple of times and I've passed. Mm-hmm. I'm like oh, I can't do that one, you know. Which is always the polite way you do it. You don't say yeah. hey, no, I'm not doing that room. You're like oh I can't I can't do that one. <laughs> <laughs> I think if they the... follow up with questions, why can't you? Then you tell them why. But you're just like no, I just can't. I can't do that that one yeah. on that date. Thank you for offering it to me though. Yeah, no one, no, no booker is going to put in the effort to be like, but why? Yeah. <laughs> but tell us why. So for, uh, I don't mind saying this, it's a, it's two hundred dollars to headline. Oh, and, it's better than it used to be then. Oh yeah. my god, they've got it up to an actual rate then. So I think like oh, I don't okay. know what they, I don't, but I still agree with Hold your on, sentiment. Send an email real quick. <laughs> Hey, y'all remember me? Hey, what's up? I, it turns out I can do that one. Uh. Uh, but yeah, it's still too low because they sell actual tickets and they want you, to, and they don't put you up. Mm-hmm, yeah. And so yeah. after that, I just drove, I just drove home the four hours or whatever the hell it was. Um, but it's annoying because it's, you know, it's a tourist city. It's a big room that they sell tickets to. They sell drinks and food and they're, they, they, they ask quite a bit of you. They ask for a full headliner set, you know, mm-hmm. after, you know, you had, <laughs> so the host, the longtime host does like two magic tricks up top and you can tell the show's going to be fine because the audience is reacting mm-hmm. to these magic tricks. And I was like, this is the fucking dumbest shit I've ever seen. They're, uh, like, kid, they're like kids' birthday party magic tricks. They're not yeah. Like, they're, yeah. It's not like amazing magic. It's like stuff you, you can buy a kit for. Yeah, it's terrible. Yeah. It's terrible. And the middle went up, and she struggled, but the audience stuck with her, mm-hmm. and she closed strong. And then I went up and was silly because I didn't care, <laughs> but I had a I had a fun set. Um, they were on board, but yeah, man, it's I think with especially agencies that put you in these rooms. Mm-hmm. After that show on Thursday, I felt I was so mad. I felt disrespected. Does that make sense? I was like, these motherfuckers are trying to set me up for failure. Do you know what it feels like to walk into a room and just be surrounded by, like, every, like, <laughs> the American flag remixes just coming at you? Well, I think also there's a thing, too, where a lot of these agencies have never stepped foot in the actual rooms. You sure. Know, I think they, they probably ask some questions, like, how big is it? How many does it seat? Like, what's your budget? That kind of stuff. But, I mean... You know, I'm sure they don't travel around all these rooms that they book. They just feasibly can't do that. And, sure. Yeah. I will. T- I can. I. I mean, I. I will say. I. I. <laughs> I am the one that said yes. Yeah. I, I could have looked up where I was going on a yeah. map and said, "Hey, I'm busy," like you just said. Uh, yeah. But I was it's like, a- "Yeah, I'll go to Springfield slash Battle Creek and have a yeah. battle." Uh. Well, there's a. <laughs> That was the battle in Battle Creek. Yeah. Um, well, I will say this, too, uh, about that room. And, and just my experience this last time was what was interesting was my opener uh, is uh, half uh, Mexican. But he didn't talk about it at all on stage. And the GM afterwards was like, yeah, like, they really love it when people, like, you know, like, different, you know, different races come in, comics are different races, and they really talk about it and make a bunch of jokes about it. And so he's like, oh, I should have worn a sombrero. <laughs> he was also just like, no, fuck that, you know. Yeah. So no, I think man. the fact that you didn't play a caricature, like you said, where you, you realize in that moment that maybe that's what they were expecting you to do is to start to do a bunch of black stereotype jokes and things like yeah. that. And they were just waiting, like, 
why, why, why is he doing? Why do you like white people talk like this and black people talk like this? Why, we're all here. So um, it's a it's a credit to your integrity uh, that you did that. So um, yeah, I wouldn't I wouldn't go throwing those words I mean, around. I did, Matt. I did black people talk like this and white people do. It's one of my favorite bits you do. Thank you. <laughs> I get upset when you don't do it. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I feel like it's a fresh spin because my black people talk like this is just my Obama impression. <laughs> <laughs> and then, and, then and your white people, people talk. talk it's like also an. It's also <laughs> Obama. <laughs> uh, I was gonna say honey boo boo, but yours is funnier. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Oh man! So I had a I had a freaking up and down week, man. But that's it was like every type of show in the microcosm that you could have outside of a proper stand up comedy club because I didn't yeah. do any of that. But yeah. what did your week look like? Uh, well, my week uh, started off on Wednesday. Uh, two really great comedians and friends were in town. Zach Peterson and Casey Crawford were in town for the Dropkick Comedy Show at the Orbit Room. So just. Uh, Met up with those guys, went to the show, and you know supported, and uh, they crushed it, of course, because they're super fun. And then I was able to get them on uh, the Comedy Attic open mic the next night. They had an open mic, uh, open night on their tour, and so okay. I got them both on the mic. And uh, Denise and I met them for dinner. We had a lovely ramen dinner, and then uh, she went home, and the three of us went to the mic. And again, I just watched because the mic was so full, and uh, so I just did a lot of comedy support for the most nice. part. Um, and then I did have a show. What was my one show? I, I remember that better than the show that I did. <laughs> Comedy oh, support for the soul, baby. Yeah. Uh, but on Saturday, uh, I was in uh, Leesburg, Indiana, which is outside of like Warsaw and Fort Wayne, just kind of in the middle of nowhere, uh, Indi- northern Indiana. And it was at a winery, and it was a great show. It was a lot of fun. Um, I had a, a husband and wife team open for me, which I've never had. That really? Yeah, out of Detroit, the Gillen Brands, um, uh, Jason and Robin, and uh, Robin hosted and Jason featured, and they both are relatively new. I think that Robin says she's been doing it for four years, and Jason, I think maybe five or six, um, and uh, they both were very solid for the amount of time that they've been doing it. They were like, they were pros, you know? Oh, it's and awesome. So, yeah, and so uh, we just had a fun show. It was like, not sold out, but full basically sold out there's like maybe one or two tables that weren't full and or weren't didn't have people at um there was a bachelorette party there who left during the feature set which is the best and then i didn't have to deal with them but i could dunk on them i immediately i opened my set by dunking on them which immediately endeared me to the rest of the crowd oh were they being a problem they were being a little chat they weren't bad they were being a little chatty they were kind of in the back corner and both Robin and Jason have been around the block, so they knew to kind of give them their flowers, like, shout out, like, hey, congratulations, you know, like, and had, like, one quick, look thing with them. Okay. And then they tried to get in their material, but, you know, like every bachelorette party everywhere, after so long without being part of the attention, the center of attention, they had to just start, like, we're going to just start talking about da 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 or whatever. Yep. Um, and so uh, it was a lot of fun, man. It was just a one and done, drove up, did it, drove home. Uh, but it was cool, man. I would definitely would do that show every year because uh, people on the winery were super nice and yeah. people who came out were good. You know, Is that a Tuttle joint? It is not a Tuttle joint. I know that they do a lot of winery stuff. No, this is yeah. a Jason Douglas joint. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. 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 So it was a lot of, it was cool, man. Uh, so not uh, He booked a good to- show? <laughs> what? Speaking of people that don't, uh, speaking of people that don't, Step foot in the rooms that they oh, send yeah. people to. But. There's no way that he does, because he has rooms all over the country. There's no way yeah. that he checks out every room. Yeah, He had that uh, room in Mishawaka that I love to do, and that place closed down. Okay, it was like the okay. smokestack. Um, oh, that was him. Yeah, that was a fun yeah. one, too. Yeah. yeah no, so. mine, mine was good, man. And, uh, you know, like, uh, I worked. A, a beautiful thing happened on stage during that show, which was uh, I committed to working on new stuff, right? even though I was doing 45 and, and like, you know, and then like wineries, <clears throat> you know, aren't ideal. Like architecturally, they're high ceilings, they're right. concrete floors, the tables are kind of far away and everything. Um, but I was just like, no. So I took a set list up with me because I was like, I need to be working on this new stuff and with the stuff that I know that's going to work. But as I was doing a new bit, which I had gotten to kind of work, I was like, if it worked enough, I just kept talking through it and I figured it out. I solved it on stage. I was like, oh, that's the end. Like, I almost announced it to the audience and to myself. 
I was like, as I was like just talking through it, I hit the punchline I had been closing the, that joke on, and then I just kept it going a couple of more steps. I was like, that's it. That's where it needed to go. That's beautiful. Yeah. yeah. So even you know, and yes, I like to get paid money to do comedy, and I sold some merch and everything, and that's all great. But like that show was alone. Just for that fact alone, was worth it. Was worth the three and a half hour drive up, do it three and a half hour back. In my opinion, because I, I've had that joke for a minute, and as I've been doing it, and for whatever reason, open mics I've been doing it at, other shows I've been slipping it in, it just was never unlocking in the way it needed to. Mm-hmm. And so, yeah, that was uh, that was my big highlight. So I give that's that amazing. Like Ten out you of You think 10. that's like I, I love it when that happens, and you have no control over. When that happens, like you're like, all right, I'm gonna write and rewrite this bit. I'm gonna work it out on stage, and then you're at a winery <laughs> in the middle of nowhere, and it's like, there it is. That's beautiful. I love that. I love that so I, much. I think it's also because just if you're in that super loose mindset, and I had mm-hmm. been doing really well before I got into that chunk, and so I just I don't want to say I felt invincible, but I was like, all right, I'm, I, I it's, it doesn't matter if I just kind of add a few more sentences that the end of this don't go anywhere right? because it's going to be fine because they're on board. I've got them. I know what's coming up next is going to work, you know? Yep. So I think just being in that super loose uh, space is what did it. So yeah, that was it. Uh, not nearly as up and down as you <laughs> had like, a pretty nice week. Now, to be honest, you know, my man, my man found the flow. He's got a new closer. I mean, I'm out here. I'm out here trying to figure out geography of Michigan. <laughs> Jesus. Oh man! man. <laughs> All right, it's good um, weeks, man. It's some good weeks, man. Uh, man, we have uh, spent a lot of time uh, on so far in this podcast just catching up on shows. That's what happens when uh, we're busy, busy bees. Um, should I we was... jump into the question of the week? What do you want to do? Yeah, let's let's do that, man. Uh, that was I was ranting. I was I was loaded up. Yeah, I had a battle is, in Battle Creek. It's a special two part episode. Yeah. <laughs> And one more thing about that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, man. man. All right. Uh, thank you, everybody who listens to the podcast. This is a good time to remind you. If you don't mind, please uh, subscribe to the podcast, like it, leave us a comment, uh, refer it to other friends of yours. It is growing slowly but surely, and uh, and that's cool, man. It's cool that we have people that are out there listening to the podcast and digging it, and a lot of those people are sending in questions, which we are tackling that question every episode. This question came to us through our Gmail account, which is the preferred way, and that is mattanddwight at gmail.com. That is just M-A-T-A-N-D-D-W. W-I-G-H-T at gmail.com. So if you have a question that you want us to tackle, uh, a topic in comedy, or uh, just you want to hear about parts four through seven of the Battle Creek saga, uh, just email us, and we'll send you the transcripts of the (laughs) the part of the podcast we had to edit out for time, the six hours (laughs) (laughs) Dwight went through everything. Um, This one uh, comes from Lady T. I've known Lady T for... uh, 20 plus years uh, back in my rock and roll tour management days. Uh, one of the uh, sweetest, most awesome human beings I've ever met. Uh, yeah. My friend Tina uh, is not a comedy person, but she's been checking out the podcast and she s- says that she's digging it. Um, That's awesome. She, Any uh, relation to Ice? I don't think so. Okay. Um, just that, just I don't know if he got, I don't know if he's got family in, uh, in Boston or not, but uh you know, uh, well, I'll, I'll follow up. I'll let you know. From the future. Let us know, Lady T. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, Lady T sent in a couple of questions, uh, but uh, one of them, the main question is essentially, do you think there are any boundaries around what is or isn't appropriate to joke about? Do you adhere to the belief that everything is fair game if you can pull it off slash bring a new spin to it, or are there some topics that you see as taboo? This obviously is a big hot topic in comedy as, like, the... Um, free speech warriors and like the anti-cancel culture and anti-woke uh, like sort of wing of comedy is is rising. Um, and Marin yeah. takes a, a big shot at him in his new special. I saw a clip of that come across my social media feed from his HBO special where he goes after them, which I love Marin for a lot of reasons, but he's been a very loud voice and kind of dismantling this argument uh, yeah. with this platform of WTF and everything like that. But Theoretically, at the core of it, it is still a very interesting question, right? Um, of course. So I'm going to let you take a first stab and see what you think. Do you think there are any topics that can, cannot be joked about, and if not, why? I, I, <laughs> I do not believe that there are topics that cannot be joked about. In my view, it is a reference of 
the comic's perspective and their own experience. I think there are a lot of comics that try to do things outside of themselves, and that's where that's where you really get the cringy bits that you see go viral, or that like uh, we should be able to say anything we want about anyone we want about any topic that we want. Uh, I don't think that every comic should try to joke about every topic. I, I, I don't know why. Like you have your own lived experience. Um, you know, there are certain comics that they, they want to be George Carlin and just have, or they want to be Chappelle and they want to really dive into hot button topics of the day without the proper care research, uh, belonging to that community. And it's at least, at least not funny. And at worst, it's dangerous. Um, now that's, there are comics that do it well. That's why, you know, that's why I view, you know, comics that can pull these things off in very high regard. Um, but it's difficult, but so is writing comedy. And so if you, if you're just going to be lazy about it, uh, especially, you know, I think a term that's used a lot is punching down. I used to hate it. I think it's apt in the comedy landscape that we live in, where I'm just going to make the easiest joke possible because this person's in front of me, uh, even though I don't live their experience. And I just don't think that's what comedy is in 2023. Uh, I think it's a bad read. I don't think you need to do it. Uh, anything that <laughs> anything that is going to make the audience go, oh, shit. Um, especially, you know, I think people that listen to this are either starting out or they've been doing it for a while. I'm not sure why you would make that decision if you're trying to work professionally. Uh, I don't know why you would make that decision, period, but... Um, there are people that feel like they've earned that right, and so they make those decisions. But that's my view on it. I don't write that way, but I understand that, you know, I'm not everyone. There is an audience for everyone. I don't, I don't love that type of comedy. Um, so I, <laughs> I'm maybe the wrong person to ask. I think, above all, you gotta be funny. You gotta be at least interesting. If you're out here trying to make points, um, then... You know, sell your special to Fox Nation. They're taking applications. Yeah. They'll post any fucking thing on <laughs> on their site. But yeah, man, that's that's my view on it. What about you? I think. Well, I think obviously there's a lot of crossover, and we agree. Uh, I think that the the idea of the is it your experience, right? And your it's something that it's actually your life experiences is definitely something I've not heard brought up in this conversation before that I think is very valid. I think this is such a this is going to be an ongoing thing forever because yes again like no there's no topic that can't be joked around about or have a joke written about it if the joke is good enough and who's delivering it right mm -hmm. and that problem that like caveat that sort of thing like you know um is the, then inspires a bunch of like terrible comics who they just see i, I i'll just use this as an example you know doug stanhope is a one of a kind comedian. He can talk about some really terrible things. He can talk about, he can make really awful jokes, but there is an intelligence and a point to it. And there is a, I'll just go back to intelligence again. He's an intellect. There's an intellect to when he does these terrible jokes, he's making a larger point usually. Mm -hmm. Right. And unfortunately he has spawned a generation, a couple generations now of comedians who just hear the terrible, awful shit. And that's what they do. There's no, I'm not saying this terrible thing to illustrate a bigger point. It's just, I'm just going to say the terrible shit. Right. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, and I think that there's other examples of that too, you know, like, um, I don't know. It's just, it is, it is problematic. Cause you also like, if they're young comics, everybody's bad at comedy when they start. If mm -hmm. you're a young dude and you love that kind of edgy com edgy comedy, um, you know, and you're trying to emulate that it's understandable. But when there are elders in comedy, and more importantly, when there are audience after audience after audience after audience after audience that are telling you that that shit is not funny, then maybe you should stop doing it, mm -hmm. right? And 
when I say audience, I'm not talking about your other dipshit open mic buddies that are also in their early 20s in the back of the room laughing hysterically because you're making this very horrific rape joke or some joke that's racist, but you're going to claim that it's not, or you're going to claim free speech or whatever. And so it comes back to a lot like what you're talking about. It's like, it's, it's bad comedy. Yeah. You know, um, I know for a lot of reasons that he's actually, this would be interesting to get your, your take on this. Um, this is pre scandal and pre, you know, him getting, uh, kick to the curb but when Louis C.K. was the biggest comedian in the world I, he, had yeah. a bit, he had a bit about the n-word he yep. said about reading Huck Finn to his kids mm -hmm. and how much the n-word is in that book and he says the n-word in the bit yep. and then he has a bit about like when you say the phrase the n-word you're actually just making the person say the actual word in their brain so he had a couple of bits about the n-word where he said it right as a right. comic he's a very good comedian mm -hmm. that bit was very funny should he still have done it? I don't know. That's up for debate. You know, yeah. like as, as as a black person, were you offended when you heard those Louis C.K. bits? I did cringe. It was uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. You know, you got to think of it from the perspective if I'm watching with a white person, they just heard, they turned to me to react to hearing a white person say the N-word, mm -hmm. uh, which is tough. You know, I thought the bit was funny without him having to say that. But back to what you said, he has earned the right to take these chances. He's not a comic starting out. So I view it from that lens as a comic of like, all right, he's not just saying it and then like moving on. He's building a bit around it. Um, I didn't love it. I don't like it when white comics say it, even if they are, like, trying to push boundaries or anything like that. The same way I don't like it when, you know, like, Chappelle harps on the trans community. Mm -hmm. uh, it's just, like, it's, okay, it's point-making. It's, like, I'm so, I'm bigger than the world. I'm the biggest comic in the world. That means that affords me the right to say these things or stop these opinions. Now, I don't think, like, I don't think one's similar to the other. I think they're vastly different. But just to make the point of what you said about intellect, I think you do have to have care when you're approaching these topics, no matter what level you're at. And in Louis's case, it felt like it was done with care, even though I don't like it. And in Chappelle's case, it seemed like it was done more reckless, um... And then just like spiteful for no reason, right. well, but that doesn't. Up the spiteful for him too. Yeah, and it's like, it's, you know, you look at comedy history where, you know, comics literally got arrested for cursing on stage. You look at Carlin's uh, his any bit that he has about language, not just not just the dirty seven words. Like any bit he has about language is very. Timely, you have, you know, Dick Gregory and Richard Pryor that dive in all to all these topics, and um, I think a lot of comics that you know quote these people or like look up to these people, which you should, uh, don't fully grasp that we live in a vastly different comedy landscape. Well, it's even different than when Louis did those N-word jokes. I mean, yeah. those are, what, 10 years ago now, probably? Probably, uh, yeah. Or whatever, and it's, it is. It's a changing landscape, and uh, there's nothing that makes you sound more like an old man if you're Jerry Seinfeld and, like, complaining about, can't say nothing no more. Like, when has Seinfeld <laughs> ever gotten into trouble for any joke? <laughs> like, what yeah. About? But, um, like, you know, but also, yeah, you have to just adjust with the times. It is one of these things, too, where I, I agree, like, the the cringiness of it is there. And I think also with, in the case of Louis, like, he knew he was pushing buttons by actually saying. He could have done those bits without saying the word. Of course. He was trying to get away with it, you know. It, like, he was trying to get be naughty, you know, like, mm -hmm. you know, in the bit. So he knew what he was doing. Um, but I just use that as an example because it's also, it's it's a way more complex thing with that bit if, mm -hmm. at, even at the time like now it's even more complex because of who he is but yeah. like it's still like if there was some an open mic that tried to do a white open micer who tried to justify using the n-word and the joke 
it would have been way more cut and dry. Like, I've seen you know. I've seen it happen twice, man. Yeah. Like I've seen it. <laughs> I've seen it happen twice. I've confronted a person who was super apologetic and another person that just like you said stuck to his guns and tried to defend it. It's like I'm not I'm not saying it I'm not calling anybody it. It's like yeah. I guess, man, like but what what do you think is going to happen in rooms when you do this and you are not Louis C.K.? You yeah. you don't have this built up decades worth of trust where the audience are like, all right, well, <laughs> we'll at least stick with them. Yeah. Anyone else, I probably would have just turned the special off. Mm -hmm. But I was yeah. like, oh, okay, let's see. That was wild, but let's see <laughs> what else he has to say. And well, if you're a, yeah, if you're at an open mic just talking reckless, then I'm not going to sit and listen to that bullshit. It's not going to yeah. be funny or interesting to me. I do think, and I, I know that you're in agreement with this too, that the best comedy has an empathy to it. Not, you know, the the whole idea of punching down is been around forever, but it's also, it's not that we're like a different society now. It's still the same makeup people, makeup of people. We've always mm -hmm. had minorities. We've always had women. We've always had gay people. We've always had trans people. As much as they want to act like that, they're a brand new flavor. You know, trans people have been here forever. Um, it's just that people have really had enough and are like speaking up for themselves and through social media, like Twitter and everything, you're now hearing about it, right? Mm -hmm. As opposed to them just like leaving a show, getting up and leaving a show, like fuck this shit. Yeah. You know? um, they're, now there's social media, right? To where they can uh, talk about fuck this shit and you know, mm -hmm. get a lot of other people who didn't even see it. They're like, oh yeah, fuck that shit together, right? Get this, <laughs> this groundswell of fuck that shit. Yeah. Um, and here's the thing is like, I, you know, I'll, I'll just, I'll talk about a personal experience with this sort of idea is even though I didn't start to comedy until I was 35 years old, I still was a new comic at 35 years old. I was still a new comic. Right. And I was still drinking back there. And, and I had a joke where I said that a friend told me that I was this, uh, I was a high functioning alcoholic, which is kind of like being told that you're the smartest type of, and then I would say the R word. Right. Mm -hmm. And I would justify it. And the fact that I wasn't calling, I was calling myself it. And I was using it in the medical definition of it, blah, blah, blah. But at the end of the day, it was all bullshit. Yeah. It was all me trying to justify using a, you know, like a, an edgy word, right? Mm -hmm. um, although I didn't do it because it was edgy. To me, it was, I think it was like, you know, I, I didn't think that, I didn't think through how that word affected people, right? Right. Who have it's... someone in their life who has, uh, you know, uh, uh, mental, you know, uh, like a learning disability or mental um, illness or anything that you would lump into that sort of category of that slur, right? And so uh, mental illness is not the right word, but, you know, mental disability or something yeah. like that. Um, and so I learned, I learned to be better. Yeah. And uh, we talk about this idea of like talking, when, whether or not you can talk about stuff that's not in your own experience. I do have a joke about my friend Kit who's trans and her transition and I wanted to tell her story and I performed it for her in her living room before I ever did it on stage. Yeah. I was like, hey, remember the phone conversation we had after your bottom surgery mm -hmm. and how funny that was? I want to talk about it on stage. Can I do it? Here's how I want to do it. And then I then even even after that, I still ran up by. Uh, a, a trans comic that I'm friends with, Sophie, um, uh, what can I remember Sophie's name? Sophie Hughes. Uh, yeah. It's been a minute since I've seen Sophie. And I also ran it by um, another kind of prominent person in the LGBTQ community. I was like, am I on the right side of this? Not can I get away with it. Right. Not can I get away with this and it'd be okay and I won't get in trouble. It's like, am I on the right side of this? Is there any misstep in this joke where I'm not making it clear that I'm supporting trans rights, that I love my friend, right? Is it still come off that I'm being shitty and dunking on the trans experience, right. you know? And when I got the clearance from all three of them, particularly Kit, Kit was like, that's hilarious. And the only uh, caveat I have is you have to do it at every single show. <laughs> <laughs> that's so, uh, a, yeah. yeah, I think, and, go ahead. You know, I was gonna say, and so I think you can talk about things that are outside of your own personal experience because that was Kit's story. It's Kit's story, right? Mm -hmm. The story that it tells about a phone conversation that we have. So it's not just me objectifying her and like, you know, Oh, I have a trans friend. Let me talk about that. That's really hot right now, you know, or whatever. Um, but it was a story that I, story that I wanted to share, but there's also like things too, where, you know, my wife is Filipino. 
my mother-in-law, uh, uh, one of my mother's, one of my mother's in-laws, um, is also Filipino, and she loves Joe Koi. And she has told me she's like, you should do some jokes about your Filipino. And no, what? <laughs> For who? <laughs> I was gonna say, I'm not. Yeah, Joe Koi can talk about his Filipino mama. I'm not gonna make jokes about my God. Filipino in-laws. It's like I just immediately like, nope, that's not gonna work. That's, that's amazing. Not. But there are white comics who would do it. There are white comics who would do it, and they've been for years about you know their you know their their black and their Latino in laws or their spouses. Yeah, you know where it is in the, in the end of the day, kind of derogatory. You know, sure, sure. I, I think even, yeah, yeah. I don't what race Denise is. Whenever I talk about being in an interracial marriage, I don't even say what a race is because I just wanted to leave it. You don't know, because I'm not making any jokes about any specific race. I'm talking about race relations. I'm, really, all the jokes I talk about being in an interracial marriage come back to um, the sense of, like, white guilt in this country or mm -hmm. white people's racism or something like that. You know, it has nothing to do because, again, not my experience. So, yeah, I think that um, this is a, a sticky one. This is a heck of a question to send in. That's a fantastic question. It's, this uh, could have been, been the full first 46 minutes instead of your... Uh, <laughs> like, uh, <laughs> oh, they want to they tell me what I can and can't say in Battle Creek. I got to cross over to Springfield if I want to talk like that. Uh, uh, but I want to come back to one point real quick before I, I, I turn it back over to you. And that, the thing is that I think I touched on it for a second, but young comics, please listen to the elders in your comedy scene and the people who, you know, uh, you know, you often see this thing where a young comic doesn't get in immediately at the comedy club. Maybe they live in a city where this has a fantastic comedy club and they get butt hurt about that. And then they frame it on this idea of like, Oh, because I, you know, they don't let me talk about whatever and say these slurs and they're too uptight or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, or they're too restrictive. They won't let me say the word fuck, right? Because the crackers, you know, forever, you can't say the word, you can't say the word fuck during the open mic. And there were comics that were immediately like, oh, I'm not going to do that club anymore. It's like, if you can't do five minutes without saying the word fuck, you're not very good at comedy. Um, and so there's a reason that there are all these rules in place at every club. Young comics, if you are listening to this and you do think yourself edgy or whatever, two things. One, try to get over yourself. If you want to be a professional comedian, like, you don't have to talk about that shit all the time. Two, we live in a post two girls, one cup world. <laughs> there is nothing edgy about comedy whatsoever. I've seen like, it all. You can watch people get beheaded live on YouTube by ISIS. Mm -hmm. There's no little jokey joke you're going to come up that's blowing people's minds. People are not laughing because it's not funny. That's the mm -hmm. end of it. People, there are very edgy comics who get a lot of laughs. Anthony Jessamick is a very dark, edgy comic, and he gets a lot of laughs because he's that good. If yeah. you are doing edgy material and you're not getting laughs, it's not the it's not the topic. <laughs> it's the, it's the joke your skill set, and you need to work on it. So that's the end of my soapbox. I appreciate it, man. Yeah, that's a lot about perspective. My question is, uh, why can Louis say it, but when Kramer says it, he gets canceled? I know. This is bullshit. Right? Yeah, I think it was the yelling. I think it was most of the yelling and the pointing that Kramer did. Ah, <laughs> Black people like that stuff. Uh, <laughs> wow. Yeah. I guess, guess who else is going to get canceled now? <laughs> yeah, we're, we're trying to get those views up. And uh, controversy is the way. No, that was, uh, I think that's a great bow to put on it, Matt. You, you really touched on... Um, you know, when you come from these, when you come at these things from a place of love and you put in the work, not just like, Hey, uh, I have to write the best bit and rewrite it and try it on stage. You actually went to people from the community that you're talking about and like ran it by them like a human being, like you would, if you were talking about like gas station food with someone else that travels a lot, like it's that sort of like, Hey, let me run this past you because you have this experience, mm -hmm. uh, you know, and if I'm out of pocket at all about egg rolls, let me know. Yeah, I was going to say, I like that you compared the trans community to Casey's Pizza. Casey's. Pizza. No, 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 no. <laughs> at you least Little Caesars. <laughs> <clears throat> all right. <laughs> 
thank you so much for your uh, question, Lady T, aka T. We appreciate uh, you. I do appreciate you very much. Uh, just, it's cool to have friends as long as that too. That's one of the best parts about getting older. And I actually, have a bit about this now. Is, is like when you have friends. It's actually how I get into talking about Kit actually, because Kit's another one of my friends I've had for almost thirty years now. So, uh, it's always nice when people circle back around and are checking out your new shit and being supportive. So, thank you. Uh, Tina, I really appreciate that, and I know Dwight does too. If anybody out there wants to send us a question, uh, please make it uh, less complicated and complex than the one that Tina sent. Make something real cut and dry. Yeah, like what? Is, anybody ask us our favorite color or like what's what's yeah. our favorite season of Breaking Bad yet? Like get into these philosophical discussions. It's tough, yeah. But you can do that at our email. It's just uh, it's Matt and Dwight at uh, gmail.com. So that is M A T A N D D W I G H T at gmail.com. That's where you can send a question. We have gone a little bit over time, but I do want to end like we always do. Uh, let's talk about where we're going to be this next week. Uh, what you got coming up, Dwight? I will be at Googman House Brewing. That is a brew tube comedy joint in Indianapolis Friday, the 24th, February 24th. So. Please come out. i got a great, 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 great lineup I really lucked into. So um, February 24th, Gookman House Brewing. You can find tickets or anything else about me at DwightSimmons.com. That's all I'm promoting. What about you, Matt? I've got a couple of things. On Thursday the 23rd, I will be hosting Don't Tell Comedy in Bloomington, Indiana. We are at a super cool location uh, this time. All the locations have been cool, but this one uh, is not only super cool, but it also has a little bit of comedy history to it, even though it's not a comedy venue. Ooh, uh, uh, dropping yeah. clues. Yeah, and we got a very cool headliner that we're catching coming through uh, on tour from L.A., and then following night, uh, that's in Bloomington, Indiana, if I did not say that. And then on Friday, the 24th, I'm headlining the Comedy Attic, two shows uh, with my friends, Natalie Bainter, Mohammed Sahir, and the return of Joshua Murphy. What? One, one of the original Bloomington Comedy Attic comics is coming out of retirement and doing uh, spots on those shows. Uh, so it's a big deal. It's a big deal to me, honestly. I love Josh as a person, yeah. and I love his comedy, so it's very nice that he's kind of making his official return on my show on the 24th. Tickets for sale uh, for both of those. You can find those uh, at my website, madelonamartincomedy.com. Every one of those words has a hyphen in between it, except for comedy and com, in which there is a dot. So that is M-A-T hyphen A-L-A-N-O hyphen M-A-R-T-I-N hyphen comedy.com. That's it. That's all I got. Uh, this was a good one. We really got into uh, the ups and downs of a week on the road uh, as a comic. Uh, we got into a thorny, and uh, yeah, we didn't solve that issue. We took we took our bites of the apple. This is the way we mm -hmm. look at it. But I'm sure that idea of what can or can't you talk about in comedy is going to be around forever. And uh, and again, hopefully everybody just uh, keeps pushing towards empathy. I think that's a yeah. smart way to go. Uh, but thanks everybody for listening to this episode of the podcast. We'll be back next week. You got any words of wisdom? Lead them, leave them on, Dwight. Yeah, man. Wear that black and white merch. Stay out of That's Battle it. Creek. Stay out of Battle Creek. <laughs> <laughs>